This is an I Read Comic Books mini-sode. I am your host for this episode, Mike Rappin, and with me for this just very, very strange journey that we're going to go down today is Nick White. Hey! Nick, uh, we're, we're on... We're, this week, for this episode, this mini-sode, we are talking about Volume 3 of the series Ice Cream Man. Before we get into anything, I want to say full spoilers for Volume 3 because we're going through some deep shit, and I will just say that my opening notes for this volume are, oh... <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this is Ice Cream Man Volume 3, Hopscotch, Melange. This is written by W. Maxwell Prince with art by Mark Martin Morazzo, colors by Chris O'Halloran, and letters by good old Neon. Nick, where were we last time we left off in Volume 2 of Ice Cream Man? So, at the end of Volume 2, uh, that ended with the issue that had us following around the... Um, team in the ambulance as we watched the city which i don't think has a name i don't think that's an accident it just doesn't yeah. have one um as we watched it sort of descend into rampant madness yeah and yeah at the tail end of the issue we discovered that they had uh caleb in the back of their ambulance and his fate was kind of left uh unknown i think is probably the best i mean it didn't look good but it, in terms of being like is he dead or alive i think that was sort of uh up for grabs so well to it was it was ambiguous but at the same time there was this clear heart monitor thing that was mm -hmm. happening i don't know if that's caleb i don't know if that's something else and i think in this volume we kind of discover maybe caleb isn't human or maybe he can't die Maybe he can. We don't know. I, I I don't know. But I guess we open on issue number nine for this volume, and it starts long ago. At least that's what it says, or at least that's what I took away from it. Um, and we're getting some fucking lore in this issue. <laughs> I said, okay, I'm in. Yeah, the issue begins, uh, quote, longer, longer ago than there are numbers to express, which, um, yeah, interesting, interesting. And it seems like I, I I really didn't know what the point of this issue was until the very end of it. Um, they they talk about like the narration is coming from Ice Cream Man, or at least that's Ricardus. I guess we can call him a Rick. Sure, I, he, this guy's got a bunch of names. The, it, they're talking about these pre animals, animals that will eventually become wolves, animals that will eventually become spiders, um, and. He, I, I don't know. Caleb is our is kind of the character that we're following, and he's riding through the desert to go meet this old man, and so is Ricardus. I guess he gets to this house, and there's this old man who has this book about the future. I I don't know, Nick. There, there's a lot. There's a lot in this issue. Um, basically to take in very quickly. Like Caleb gets to this house. It turns out he is the nephew of this quote unquote old man, and then Ricardus shows up, aka the ice cream man, and he's like. Caleb's cousin and also the nephew and they all use magic or they all have the ability to use magic but Caleb is upset that Ricardus is using their magic inappropriately and there's a new world that's coming the old man has a book about it and that there are rules for it and they must be followed I I don't know I was very impressed mostly by the color work in this issue and I was trying not to like get into deep in my own mind about the lore here what, what was your take on it <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you're not wrong. There's there's a lot to dissect here. Um, obviously, I think what we were sort of looking for after Volume 2 and seeing a bit of this interaction and relationship between Rick and Caleb was, okay, like, how did this begin? What's, their, what's the true origin of their interactions? And um, a couple notes that I had was... Uh, First off, this book has ongoing obsessions with both eyes and spiders, and this issue has spiders with lots of eyes. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm not certain why the spider is such a big ongoing motif. I still really haven't um, dissected that, but obviously that's definitely a part of it. Um, it's also interesting to note that Caleb isn't called a man, but he's called a god-man with no spaces. Yeah, with and lightning. What in does his that head. mean? I'm not sure. Was I imagining that this issue, uh, this locale, this um, planet, whatever you want to call it, um, 
it has two sons. Was I imagining that? Oh, I I didn't notice that. I let me. I'm paging through it. Like I've got it. Yep, with the opening page has two sons for sure. So okay. this is definitely not Earth? Question mark. I I don't know. Well, I mean, I suppose it has to be Tatooine. We've been told it's a long time ago, but maybe it's also in a galaxy far, <laughs> far away. So, yes, yes. I mean, you never know. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so so Caleb, as he returns home. He tells us to, quote, see this treacherous route, and no, you too will travel it eventually, because all paths are the same path, terminating at a single point, the end of the road. And this, this phrase, the end of the road, um, it's, it's something that I believe Caleb speaks, it's something that the old man speaks, it's something that uh, Rick says at the very end of the trade, and for me, there's a sense of inevitability in this statement that seems to resonate with issue six. That would be the the triptych um, red, yellow, orange issue, mm-hmm. uh, and the way that that issue ends with the phrase "one way or another." and And I think there's sort of some commonality there. There's like an inevitability that, like, one way or another, we're going to reach said point. Right. And and um, in in terms of this volume, obviously, the implication is one way or another, we're going to have to, you know, switch to another planet or, or, or move on. Um, yeah, not not to turn this into a, like a 23andMe genealogy.com uh, <laughs> moment, mm-hmm. but based on the fact that, and I sat down and thought about this for too long because I'm an idiot, but because they both call each other cousin and they both call the old man their uncle, if all of these terms are literal and not terms of endearment, um, it means that the uncle must have two additional siblings. Right, right. One, um, Both Caleb and Rick coming from each one of these uh, additional siblings. That's not to say there aren't more than two, but um, it does make one wonder, once you've sort of parsed that out, um, is that anything that we'll get at in the future? That, of course, is assuming that, again, we're talking about, when we talk about these things, we're talking about normal normal people, quote-unquote, so who knows if... If I mean, that matters. Again, um, there's there's a lot of lore to take in in this, and I, I, I didn't really see the family thing as more than a term of, en- of endearment. I saw it more of a... Oh, I so saw it as literal, yeah. yeah no, I, 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 didn't see it, I didn't see it as literal. I didn't think that they were actually related. I think that there is this... They are representations, like, and you we touch upon this further in the series, um, in this volume, but they're representations of... of entities of ideas right where Hmm. i think caleb is supposed to be like control and ricardus is supposed to be chaos the old man represents this this mixture of both where why not just make them brothers then sure 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 but i think that they're they're calling themselves familial means that they're related but not directly and i i I don't know. There, there's probably more to take away from it, but I'm a little bit um, hungover, so I can't think about it too hard. Unless my brain break. Uh, I mean, another know. interesting thing I noticed is that everything in this issue has what I put as a quote close but a bit off unquote element. Right. So, for example, the individuals look like humans, but not quite. The ears right. are pointy and tapered, and the eyes are really dark. And right. the planet are really looks long. like Earth, but the biology is off. And there's a two sun setup. Uh, the technology seems equal parts modern and dated. And what the heck is holding the table up at the uncle's house? I don't know if you noticed that. The table doesn't have any legs. I or did any not base. see that. <laughs> Holy crap! Yeah, lots to take in in this issue. Uh, I mean, it's funny because like there there is this discussion of magic too. Like like Caleb says he uses you know Ricardus uses their magic in a bad way. And or he's, he's getting out of hand and he uses their magic too much. Wh- whereas, you know, the uncle says, you know, it's like everything or everyone can use or the three of them can use their magic. Um, well, he says, and, like, even even the aberration or even the mutation has a reflection of the truth in it. Right. And it, it's yeah. it's like a discussion of like they all three of them can actually use magic. It just seems like Caleb doesn't. And the reason why I'm not really sure other than he thinks that their magic is fragile. And that's kind of, I think, a hint at maybe what's to come with the Ice Cream Man. I mean, we find out more that 
there's there's a long life for this guy but uh still i i thought that was an interesting moment to point out that they they all have the ability to do these types of things it's just Mm -hmm. that rick uses it in his own way to create these aberrations and stuff you almost have to wonder if maybe the magic there's some correlation between the utilization of magic and the um destruction of these worlds it could be it could if, be. Um, you know, if too much is used or something like that, you know, that's when you got to go. Um, like, for all this book talks about lightning and thunder and sibling rivalry and trickster assholes and missing eyes, like, when does this become full-blown Norse mythology is something I wrote. Yeah, yeah. That that yeah. was actually something I was wondering if they were trying to, if he was trying to write this as if it was some sort of existing mythology, but I, I can't seem to find a connection other than the lightning in his head, like Caleb having lightning in his head. Um, I, yeah. I don't even think, and that's like a stretch. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, like, the biggest question, or one of the bigger questions that I sort of fixated on after this issue had fully played out and we'd, we'd seen all the repercussions, was that um, Caleb, based on all observations, seems capable of being hurt, maybe seems capable of being mortally wounded, Definitely the same seems true of the old man. Right. Um, but Rick, Rick, Rick seems nigh invulnerable. Yeah, he does not so, seem. Yeah, Rick, that's what, yeah, I'm sorry. I was like, is that, did I mean that? Yeah, Rick. Yeah, he exactly. does. He seems like he can't be hurt. He he seems in, invincible in some ways. Yeah. Um, and, and we get to more Rick, of that later. But yeah, he definitely doesn't seem like he has the ability to be hurt. Exactly, and and as you got at this trade, as it plays on, um, sort of explores that issue a little bit more, and then explores it even more. So yeah, people who have yeah. questions about that, they do get addressed. But yeah, at its at its core level, basically, this issue says, "Hey, these two guys seemingly have been around for a pretty long time. Uh, they hop from world to world uh, when things get bad." And when they do this, they're supposed to follow the rules within a book. That's yeah. basically all we know. Um, what those rules are, uh, it's hard to say. Uh, all we can really get at beyond that is to say that Caleb seems to think on some level that Rick is violating them. And that's yeah. basically it. Yeah. Um, so. I guess to round off this issue, right... Um, Caleb essentially he they they separate ways you know they meet with this uncle they they find out that the the universe that they're in is dying and so they part ways to say okay well we're eventually going to go to the next one what that means we don't know um but Caleb has this dog this wolf that he keeps as a pet and the ice cream man says earlier in the issue he wants to turn him into a coat and of course in the night after Caleb has left ice cream man finds his fucking dog and turns him into a coat and uh there's this chase moment where uh ice cream man kind of implies something happened to the old man and so caleb goes instead of fighting ricardus which for some reason again this is another moment where he could have done something to rick he could have fought back and he chooses not to and instead for for some reason i i don't know what it is it's not revealed in this issue but um still caleb runs off to go to find the old man and turns out the old man is dead a giant arachnid has killed him and so caleb kills this new arach this giant arachnid and uh buries the old man and there's this this moment of hey see you in the next one rick which kind of becomes a theme in this story i think now at this point it's happened multiple times i'll see you in the next one i'll see you soon i'll see you this um it's really interesting. Of course, then the other thing I, I noted in, in my uh, as I was reading this was that the the ice cream man music is kind of a focal thing. It, that's kind of the representation of ice cream man or Ricardus's um, or Rick, whoever you want to call. Him. We should call him Rick. I should stop saying the long name because it sounds <laughs> stupid. Uh, he uh, his his music kind of represents the use of his magic, which I think is interesting because it kind of plays. We kind of start to. When you look back at the previous issues of the series, it's not just the the ice cream truck; it's actually his magic in action. Right? No, no, absolutely. Once once you sort of see that as his signature, so to speak, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I guess uh, any other thoughts on this issue? Number nine, I think, has like a ton of lore, um, which we're gonna fucking find out about soon, I guess. But uh, I don't know. It's it was a very interesting issue, especially given the conclusion of number or issue eight. 
Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I think that sums it up. It, As I told you a few days ago when I was starting to read this, like, it it answers a lot of questions, but it only asks a whole bunch more, which, which is exactly what you want. So, right. Right. So yeah, we, we jump into issue 10 and this issue is called border story. Um, the previous issue was called the end of the road, which I thought, you know, that's kind of perfect. Um, but yeah, issue number 10 is border story. (laughs) This is a very interesting issue because the first half of it is all in Spanish. Um, a large chunk of this is in Spanish and they just don't translate it. Um, I had the trade, and so I had the script in the back of the trade. But yeah. even still, reading it without that, like I was, I had the Google Translate app as I was reading it, and I was just like scanning the pages on my iPad as I was reading through it. <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> um, and of course, the translations aren't perfect because you know you can't do it. Literal translations don't really work very well. But um, you, you get the very, I get, I got the gist of the issue. Um, I think that this issue is pretty straightforward. It's kind of like another day in the life, which I, <laughs> if I realize uh, W. Maxwell Prince uh, and Co. They do they do a, ve- a great job of just giving you droplets of lore um, in each issue, but then they'll do these this issue like number nine, and they'll just totally blow your mind with lore, and then the next issue will be back to their little one off stories. the The one thing that I noted about this one and in issue twelve is that these ones take place very far away from where the rest of the stories have taken place so far in this series. Um, mm-hmm. With the exception mm-hmm. of issue nine, um, you know, the first eight issues have all taken place, like, in this city. We don't have a name for it, but it takes place kind of in the same place. And now we're seeing the Ice Cream Man's influence through time in different places in the world. Um, yeah, Nick, what, what was your thoughts on this issue? I know you were you sent me a message like, fucking shit, this issue is all in Spanish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's true. Uh, I I ended up uh, being the individual who took German and Latin throughout um, middle school, high school, college, and right, so right. Um, I mean, Spanish. What's that? I, same here. I took I took German as well, so I had no help outside of the little Spanish I've learned in the last year or so. Right, and so at first I was like, "Oh shit, what am I gonna do?" And so I went on to our Discord. Uh, and I talked with uh, Danny, Echo Spider, and I was like, shit, man, like, have you read this yet? And uh, he hadn't, but he was very kind enough to, I was like, you know what, I'm just going to try to plow through this. Like, uh, the internet was basically like, if your Spanish is basic to none, you'll be fine. And I was like, okay, yeah, right. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So I was like, you know what? Let's let's test the power of of comics. Let's t- let's test the power of something that isn't um you know, uh, a, a visual, a visual medium on top of being, uh, having prose elements. So it's like, I'll just plow through it. And when I'm done, let's talk. And so I, 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 I read it and then I sent him like a paragraph and I was like, does this sound about right? And he's like, yeah, that's, that's, that's close. That's pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he was nice enough to send me, uh, the screen caps of the trades translation. So oh, nice, very nice. I, I sort of had it, and then it really helped because there were definitely a few moments where I was like, "Uh, basic level Spanish is not going to cut it for this. Mm-hmm. Mid level Spanish is probably not going to cut it." Like the book ends on like a poem, and I'm like, "Okay, yeah. uh, <laughs> pretty sure Spanish isn't you know, like you basic- can, your, your basic elementary Spanish is not going to translate a very high level like poem to understand <laughs> exactly. the like intricacies exactly. of it." <laughs> um, but but beyond that, and once you got past that. Uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting because you're right. It, it is, it feels much more like we're back in the groove from volume one where it's sort of a standalone story. There really aren't carryover characters. It feels very discreet and separate and different. Um, and you're right. This is definitely a move in time and a move in place. We're now in Texas, although to be fair, we don't really ever know what state the, suburban well, town is in so I, I maybe should that's say, still I, I feel like this actually takes place in mexico just over the border because well, later in the issue there's a there's someone riding a horse towards texas not to not to nitpick Nick, parts of it are in texas parts okay. of it are in mexico okay yeah okay that i'll give you i'll give you that okay so <laughs> it's it's 1919 and it's in um i think it's in juarez technically 
Yeah, I, it doesn't matter. Anyway, that much. so yeah, uh, so we're we're basically following this girl whose name is Maria. She's celebrating uh, her birthday, and also Dia de los Muertos on the same day. People say, "Hey, maybe that's a weird slash bad idea." Well, 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 hold on, hold on. They're celebrating her quinceanera and Day of the Dead at the same time, and that right. that's supposed to be like the bad combination, like it's bad luck or bad omens to have to celebrate both of those, and yet they're still doing it. Right, and we we learn that she's arranged or set or supposed to end up marrying this guy called the general, right? Yeah, yeah, and he's a and he's a creep, obviously, and um, we find out that she's also in love with this guy named Juan, who lives in Texas, and Juan's gonna try to take her away, basically, and that's. Yeah, that's the core element, and I kind of picked up on it pretty quickly. But when you look at the visual theme of the general, when you kind of look at the hat, when you look at the colors, um, I picked up pretty quick that the quickly that that was Ice Cream Man. I um, absolutely did not until the very end. Um, okay. I but I did notice that just just now looking at the opening. Um, bit of the chapter you do see the ice cream man in the background of the first page of this issue (laughs) right if you look at the general's hat it really looks a lot like the ice cream man's hat when he's quite literally the ice cream man yeah yeah so i can definitely see it now i just i didn't pick up on it because it I does will look say like a general outfit. The outfit. issue once I had sort of grasped at that, I thought it was a really good fake out for a second because I thought Juan was actually Caleb. Ah, oh, that's that's clever. For a little bit there, I thought yeah, I thought yeah. that was Caleb because I was like, "All right, he's a cowboy. We're familiar with this cowboy thing. Like, sure, we're gonna have the two of them go battle, but it's going to be over Maria." Right. So I was like, all right, I figured this out. So, I mean, good job, W. Maxwell Prince. Like, you flipped the script on that. Right. Well, I um, mean, if there's one thing we take away from this series, it's that W. Maxwell Prince probably isn't going to fall back on any classic tropes, right? Like, and if he does, they're not very obvious until later. I mean, having, you know, two of your big bads fighting over a woman, that's kind of cliche and blah, not really what this book is about, I think. Um, so what I'm saying, right. Nick, is you're stupid. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> kidding, kidding. Well, I find it really interesting because when Juan and Maria meet up, um, he says to her um, that he's going to, f- to to free her and and essentially take her to a place where there's quote you know no generals, no old cowboys mm-hmm. unquote, which I sort of read as kind of a meta nod to the reader that Juan was going to sort of extricate her from that which plagues most. Um, characters in these issues, which is basically mm-hmm. the involvement with the brothers in their feud. Interesting. So he Interesting. he basically makes a promise that he's going to remove her from the bigger conflict that seems to plague all of these issues, where humans tend to be the victims. Which is the fact that these two brothers are, you know, not brothers. I'm sorry, they're not brothers. They're cousins. Jesus. Um, that they're that he's going to remove her from being a part of that. Yeah. Which of course, as we all well know, like is borderline impossible. Huh, so. Borderline, yes. Um, I mean, the general even tells Juan that he thought he would be taller. Yeah, and I was going to say, as we get further down in this issue, we, we get to the point where Juan is trying to sneak Maria away. He shows up at her house at night. Um, right. And I, I like that the uh, the general calls Juan John. <laughs> <laughs> right like I, it's just it's funny and you start to see him kind of transform into the ice cream man in the subsequent pages here as he pulls a knife and he puts it to maria's throat and he says you think you can get out of here you know i, I he thinks that he would have been taller he thought juan would have been taller and uh juan pulls out a gun and he shoots this general which i was mm-hmm. like holy shit that's like bold i feel like we ne- we always get more standoff time and instead he just straight up shoots him uh and we get this idea, we get this this thought about the general who says that he's he's an idea. He's not something you can actually hurt um, after he stabs Juan and kills him and stuff. But we get a nice frame of the ice cream man, teeth, like monstrous figure come out of this general for a hot moment before he runs off. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I really like the way that they, they played this out, that the ice cream man isn't some just typical white dude who just kind of shows up and assimilates and it's, he takes on the persona of someone of power 
no matter where he is and it doesn't matter the race they just he begins to look like them um that was the thing that i kind of took from that oh totally yeah i mean for me what i found to be kind of an interesting moment which i think hints at caleb and rick's relationship and sort of explains away maybe some of the past instances we've seen and maybe casts a light towards some of the future ones is that we find out that this K the cowboy uh Juan he I'm not sure if what the relationship is technically but he either lives with Caleb or he works with Caleb uh or he's his neighbor I'm not really sure yeah. which what it is but there's some association there and we find out that Caleb um after this issue talks about this idea that quote you know love is borderless it thinks nothing of fences and walls we find out that Caleb also actually seems to respect and acknowledge rules and borders and the like. Mm -hmm. Uh, He tells Juan, you know, quote, there's rules, there's rules to this world, kid. There are lines in place. And I think on some level, Caleb's also speaking to his interaction with Rick, namely that he's not really intervening with Rick. He's leaving him to do his own thing. Sort of yeah. this idea that Rick has his, you know, there's a line in the sand and Rick can do whatever he wants over here and Caleb can do whatever he wants over here. And there's kind of a hands off approach from Caleb in regards to Rick. Now, when we look at modern day issues, um, like I think uh, five with the with the corporate building and whatnot uh, and gosh, and I have to remember all of this mentally uh, seven with the invisible friend. I think I have that right. Mm -hmm. Um, We see a more interventionist Caleb. Yeah. Well, I I think the way that Caleb interacts with Rick is it's, it's very indirect. He, he reacts to things that Rick has done, but never directly to him. Uh, It sounds a little redundant. The invisible friend would be, I'd say the closest we get. Yeah. But you, whenever they're, whenever they're face to face, Caleb never directly reaches out to him. But in the case of, say, the skyscraper issue, we see Caleb running through. He shoots the vulture. He's like taking out these aberrations, but never going directly for Rick, which I think right. is a, is an interesting thing. Um, I didn't, I guess I didn't realize that until you kind of brought that up. Yeah, and and so I think in this issue that we see taking place, uh, you know, in the nineteen 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 or whatever, I think we see a more hands off Caleb, which is interesting. Um, well, I think that all, says since something. This takes place, you know, in nineteen nineteen. Maybe he's still trying to adhere to the rules of the world. Whereas, oh, I think so. Yeah. In the modern day issues, when Caleb shows up, if you recall, Rick looks scared. Like he to see, I think he was confused and surprised that Caleb interacted with him directly, like spoke to him compared to all the previous years where they probably lived close to each other. It seems like they live close, but there's always something that's intentionally separating them to see Caleb yeah, actually yeah, yeah, show yeah. up and talk to him and say, hey, I'm here, motherfucker, is like a thing that Rick, or, or, uh, Rick uh, is worried about. If he's willing to break the rules, then that means... Uh, I think some serious shit could go down. I think he fears Caleb, but he knows that he can get away with things. Um, and maybe that's something to be revealed. We don't really find out more about that in this in the rest of this volume. But um, well, I mean, it's interesting y- theory. You wrote somewhere in the notes about them being yin and yang, right? And well, it, we get. To, I'll get to that. We we could talk about that in issue twelve because I think like there is something to be said about the two of them always being within proximity of each other and kind of being balances. Yeah. Um, it's if you think about all the issues we read, um, I, we get, let's get through issue eleven because issue eleven is just fucking wild and crazy and a good old time, and then issue twelve is more serious. So maybe we can sure. get to that. Maybe we get to issue twelve. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Issue issue eleven was interesting. Um, it's it's I think an issue. It's to prove that these guys have been around on Earth for a while. This isn't just a recent ice cream man showed up and he's the new big bad. You know, on a you know. Uh, in in like a horror film, right? It's it's these guys have been here since the beginning of everything, and these are like sample stories to just kind of show their interactions and what happens. Now we I don't know if this story with Maria is going to actually carry out into a larger part of the thing. I mean, none of the stories really carry out to a larger part of anything, but um, the fact that Caleb is then living with Juan and then later living with Maria at the end of the issue, like, is he supposed to be this savior figure or is he supposed to be someone that 
actually i don't know does he care about humans does he want to like help them and live with them that was kind of the question that i took away from that issue no it's it's a great question um like his level of interaction with people um and his ability to care for or preserve them or whatever uh i mean it's it's a good question i i think offhand his interaction seems largely um i don't know he certainly doesn't seem to like love people or like care for them but i think he cares for the idea of the balance if we can call it that right right i think that's probably what really matters yeah and i i i think that you know it's it's drastically different than rick where he constantly embeds himself among the people and he's doing everything that he can to interact with them because he wants to sow chaos um I don't know. We we haven't gotten enough, I think, of Caleb's perspective on things to know if his where his like allegiances lie and what he's trying to do. I think that's the intentional mystery of the story. But um, yeah, I, I think I don't know. Issue issue number ten definitely left me with a a strange, hopeful feeling, um, which you really don't get from the rest of the series, especially diving into issue number eleven. <laughs> um. That's yeah. that's my segue into holy fucking shit. Sometimes W. Maxwell Prince just likes to have fun with his book, and in this issue, he certainly does. And it feels like a C level horror movie, um, like a man gets sucked into his TV and then is put through rigorous parodies, uh, rigorous murderous parodies of reality television shows. <laughs> yeah. No. Oh, jeez. Yeah. So. So Eleven is called TV Story, and we're following a guy named Will Parson, comma, writer, comma, 34, comma, confused. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and for anyone, and like, don't, don't, don't roll your eyes, listeners, and go, I'm better than this. You at least know what I'm talking about. For anyone who has watched reality TV at some fucking spot or another, like, you know the idea that they, you know, they cut away from the show to have these interview moments where it's this profile shot and it's, you know, Francis, comma, age 28, comma, professional surfer. And then Francis right. is like, oh, you know, I, I told you that lady was no good or whatever. Like, we're so accustomed to this that it's such a shorthand that we're used to that when it shows up in this book, we're like, okay, we're all familiar with this. Yeah. Yeah. And so Francis says he's been watching this dumb reality TV dating thing only to find himself on the show. And the initial show is basically The Bachelor. If The Bachelor was a show where everyone was a mannequin, except for Will and the ice cream man who's masquerading as the host. Yeah. Uh, and, and of the course... It's called Mannequin House. Mannequin House. And of course, uh, you got to get the rose or you're asked to leave. And um, they cut to <laughs> the the female contestant um, who's trying to pick a, a husband or a suitor or whatever. I think her name is Stephanie. Uh, yeah. And she says, quote, I got the feeling like he didn't want to be here. He'd say things like, please, I don't want to be here. <laughs> like I said, <laughs> this issue is the beginning of a lot of fun. Like, W. Maxwell Prince was just like, what if we did something crazy? And that's what this whole issue is. I love it to death. I mean, and of course, the ma- he's not picked, and he gets dragged away to be fixed or whatever. He gets um, dragged away to the, quote, room for improvement. Oh, yeah, room for improvement, because let's yeah. just play with fun words. And from here, we just basically pinball between a bunch of different shows he tries to escape room for improvement sorry he tries when he tries to escape being thrown into the room for improvement where it sounds like they're probably going to sand off his features because features are seen as as in facial features are seen as aesthetic aesthetically unappealing uh, he ends up on family autopsy where quote you've got 30 minutes to figure out what killed your surprise family member uh, to which i say uh w maxwell prince um Please stop giving Fox ideas. Right. <laughs> no, Nick, you know this would be on Nat Geo. Come on. Um. <laughs> uh, yeah, with un, under the, the auspices of being like actual scientific learning. Sure, right. yeah. Right. Yeah. They cut to a scientist who's like a PhD student who dropped out. Um, and yeah, yeah, you know, I've used a scalpel once or twice. Um, that's probably the wrong way to use it, though. And they cut back in, to a person just brutally stabbing someone it's really sick it's a really sick idea because like i said this is murderous fun yeah and and what i like about 11 is that i i I think in one on on one side of it i sort of feel like 
it's kind of just like rampant craziness and it's all right. It's like, okay, this is zany, whatever. That's, that's, that's fun to a limited point And maybe it reaches that, you know, point where it's like, all right, like I've had enough, but this issue has sort of flash forward moments and, and flashback moments, uh, that really for someone who's paid attention, there are definitely some Easter eggs and rewards here. Like, I'm pretty sure that the family autopsy scene is how we end up getting the scene of dogs performing surgery in issue number four. Oh my goodness, I didn't even put that together because yes, there is a panel. I'm looking at it right now. There is a panel that has three dogs in scrubs. Oh my yep. goodness. <laughs> it's all wow. right. You'll catch all of it someday, Mike. I'm yeah, just <laughs> geez, oh Pete. Um... Yeah, and, and, and this issue seems to have several callbacks to issue number four, which I think draws another question, which is, are certain issues, uh, do certain issues have strong parallels to another issue? Is there like a connection there? Because this feels like a really strong connection to four. Well, and, and maybe. I think there's also, like, in issue 12, there's also a lot of callbacks to issue to the previous volume in general, right? Like, there, it, we'll get to it, but like, I yeah. think. I think that th- he's doing callbacks to be like, hey, if you're paying attention, this is for you. I don't think there's like a, you need to have been paying attention in order to get some of this. I think it's all just kind of, it's callbacks for the sake of rep- referencing itself, like Arrested yeah. Development. <laughs> I mean, I mean, <laughs> we'll see. Um, we'll see how important this stuff is. But so yeah, we, we see Will leave again. He ends up on Chopped, where they're supposed to create something resembling a person from person parts in your mystery baskets. Here, here one, I do want to know no, there is a the contestants are a mannequin a dog that i guess can stand up on its hind lens and use its feet and hands and stuff and a zombie and then there is our our character our main guy um it's it's interesting it, these all all these things keep to, they they keep showing up as the four types of humans or humanoids they're i guess contestants or whatever in all these shows mm-hmm. um Except for zombies, which zombies we find out of the last one, but um, still, it's it's interesting. He's he's reusing these character types or these like species as like the focus for things, rather than just constantly introducing new stuff or only having humans or something like that. Yeah, uh, I, I think there's something to that. I'm just not totally sure what it is. Same, same here. Um, with the chopped scene, we also kind of get. Will uh, basically displaying some level of regret for never learning how to cook. He never learned how, learned how to cook because he was always getting too distracted by electronics and oh, everything. Yeah, th- in the same whole... way that with the autopsy thing, he basically shows some regret towards never really connecting with his uncle. Uh, so basically, each one of these shows is more or less fucking with his his psyche and and messing with his emotions. Well, there's a combination um, of like commentary as well as. It feels like, and I felt this about a couple of the other issues um, in this series, like the ice cream man is trying to teach someone a lesson. Like he's he's trying to show them the error of their ways in via forms of torture, a la something like the leprechaun, where like <laughs> you make a wish and then the leprechaun abuses it. Whereas, you know, here this, this guy is torturing you because you didn't call your uncle because you were too focused on your phone. You never learn how to cook because you're too focused on your phone. W. Maxwell Prince is saying people are too much on their phone. I don't think this is the first time he's brought this up in the series either. But, yeah. Uh, it's it's something that I think is interesting as if the ice cream man is justifying his actions to say, oh, no, there's a moral background to this. Um, right. Now, I mean, maybe that's Maxwell W. Maxwell Prince's intent, but I feel like that doesn't track with some of the other shit that the ice cream man has done, right? <laughs> well, yeah, in, in in its best case scenario, usually the, what the ice cream man is offering up is sort of a sense of enlightenment or self-awareness, but yeah. without an opportunity for redemption, basically. Usually, yes. Yeah. So uh, it, it's kind of twisted because he, he, he doesn't, he basically takes away the statement, ignorance is bliss. He makes you very aware of what's going on and yeah. then just basically forces you to either live with that or, or punish, you know, you, you get punished for it. So, yeah. um, yeah. what's interesting is that at the end of this issue, uh, we visit two more shows, one of which is America's Got Intestines, which the judge panel is all different iterations of ICM. Yeah. And, uh, he gets booted 
And then someone off screen says, did you get X'd out too? And I'm pretty sure this is the friend of the deceased individual in issue four. Yes. Right? That's who I thought it was as well from the eulogy okay. issue. Right. And so he's missing an arm and we'll ask him, where are we? And this guy says, uh, it's the sweet place. It's the room for improvement. It's the ice cream shop. Uh, it's a food pr- It's a food pantry. They ate my arm and called it brunch. And so we're now taken into what appears to be some version of the, uh, there's that shocking image in issue four of all these different scenes. One of which is the dogs. And it's basically, I think it's called the sweet place at that point, but we see the fact that this, the, the deceased individual is in this sort of hellish place in issue four. Mm -hmm. And now it appears that we're getting an opportunity to see, uh, to see that in greater detail. Um, we find out that his uh, will ends up getting gnawed on by, quote, the wealthy family of zombies, which is very clearly a Kardashian send up. Uh, it is interesting to point out that Will's boxers do say ICM on them. I don't know yes, if you caught that. I did catch that. It, later in the issue, in the family photo that they have, um, it, Will's sister, I'm guessing, has a shirt that says ICM as well. Yeah, I wasn't sure if that was his sister or wife, but whoever it is. Yeah, either yeah, way. Either way. Exact same thing. And then what's even crazier is we find out that the family that's asking, where's Will and Uncle Bob, they're being taped. Right. They're watching They're watching the zombie show. Right. And they're also being taped at their home as they're, like, sitting around the table for dinner. And it's a show called Missing Parsons. I'd like... Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean... uh there's, I mean, if if you want to talk about, like, what's the big takeaway here other than just rampant sadism, I suppose, um, I guess we get another glimpse of this weird hellscape prison place that Ice Cream yeah. Man is trapping people in, uh, including people we, we thought were perfectly fine. I don't mm-hmm. think there was any hint that the friend in issue four was in any danger of, of being there, and yet here he is. Yeah, I don't I don't know either. I I think well he kind of goes a little bit little wild at the end of issue 4, but I I don't know. Yeah, it's 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 kind of interesting to see them tie everything together like that. I, I what the long-term goal for that is, I don't know. Like maybe we'll find out more about this sweet place because when they're get when they get X'd out, like they're in this like dungeon almost. Um behind it's the like scenes a and everything. Yeah. yeah, it's a basement, but it looks like looks like a fucking dungeon to me <laughs> yeah uh yeah. it's kind of kind of wild uh i i don't know maybe this is just the some sort of hell that they're in um that the ice cream man has the ability to create or maybe this is what's become of the town you know like the town has maybe become this hellscape of of you know television that is constantly looping back in on itself uh what we've i think established with this is that the ice cream man's powers are a lot more a lot bigger than we probably thought like he has the ability to influence numerous and massive amounts of people at all at once um if that wasn't clear from the psychedelic funkadelic issue um what is it issue three of this series um then i i think like this is just another another piece of the pie or puzzle here to show that like this is huge um and then we get to issue 12 i uh I this issue uh I just wrote Space Spiders the end of the world um as well as some other stuff but that was the opening <laughs> of of this issue it's just called Space Story. I I noticed you know all the the three other issues beyond the end of the road are called Story. Um there's right. there's got to be something more to that. Uh but we'll I guess we'll get into it. Uh yeah, Nick, what what's up with this issue? So Again, we have this preface of, of a setting, and this one's set, quote, sooner than we'd like to admit, um, hashtag political, uh, and we've got a guy named Noah Smith aboard the Archive Recivilization Capsule, so I guess, yes, it's technically Noah's Ark. Oh, you're very clever, Mr. Prince. I did um, not put that together, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why we have this show, Mike, it's for you to catch these things, um... Um, and he spent nearly three years searching for a habitable seed world, the purpose being to revive human population on a water planet. 
And it's basically just him, this guy called Mapbot Bob, it's a robot, and the mega hard drive, no spaces. And so it feels a lot like Moon to me, or either MST3K. Yeah, um, yeah. I get both of these vibes. And uh, the idea behind this mega hard drive is that it has... And it's like, don't read into this too much, guys, because, like, I don't think there's, uh, you know, whatever. There are pictures of every creature on Earth that have been encoded with DNA with the idea that at some point they can extract it and uh, basically recreate everything the way it was supposed to be. And he's just moving along until he ends up finding space spiders and space spiders in an asteroid field, which... um. We're all quite familiar with the motif of spiders by this point. We know yeah. what that means. We know who that involves. So, uh, yeah, he he ends up crashing on a nearby moon where he picks up a radar ping from another re-civilization engineer. Apparently, other pods were sent out before the Omega event, but they always lost track of them. And yes, unless you're unsure, the Omega event is the idea that Earth did eventually blow up. Uh, as Noah points out, uh, it was, quote, all things that led to Earth's death, global warming, no, n- no brainer, uh, nuclear explosions, of course, disease, mm-hmm. and bad television were some of the culprits amongst others. Sure. Uh, bad so television. yes, Maxwell, we, W. Maxwell Prince, we did, we did read the issue before this, so we, we get the bad television <laughs> joke. Yeah. Um, yeah. so yeah, we end up crashing on this moon and then, uh, yeah, things, Things take a turn for the weird. Well, yeah, I mean, he fights a he fights a spider on the arc. Um, I think the interesting thing to call out here is yes, spiders usually mean ice cream man. However, Bob the the little robot does call these robots by a specific name, and it seems as if they're a common thing when fighting through space. Um, I, that was just the thing I thought. I don't know if that's yeah, necessarily ice I mean, cream man. Th- they seem to be a known thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so he fights one of these bad boys and then he crashes into this planet that has like flora and fauna and, um, there's all sorts of fun little terrible things out here. And it's funny, I didn't, I didn't pick it up initially, but, um, the flowers that he picks, he's like, oh, gross. These are, these are yuck. And they've got bugs all over them, similar to any time the ice cream man is involved in anything, right? Like, for instance, the Neapolitan issue where the guy ha- looks at his ice cream and he sees all the bugs in it and drops it. Like, that's a very common motif that we've seen for our, our big bad Rick uh, in this series. Yeah, I, I think if there was ever any hope that things were going to maybe turn out okay in this issue, that the bugs basically signal, oh yeah, we're fucked. Yeah, pretty much. But as this guy is traveling through this planet and walking around, he trips and falls, he finds a picture frame that has his family in it, and he's confused, he doesn't understand it, and suddenly there is this phantom space traveler um that's speaking <laughs> gibberish to i wrote him. he looks like a mysterio domed motherfucker yeah this is the, yeah, exactly he's got the foggy foggy glass helmet shit going down yeah and so before this guy can grab his gun and shoot him the phantom space traveler is gone um and then we get a small cut to everyone in that photo that he had seen of his family um is a skull and a skeleton except for him um, what does that mean? I don't know. This is just the ice cream man fucking with this guy, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, so the signal that he's been following, it ends up tracking to a burial ground for the spiders in a cave. And there's etchings on the wall of this cave. Etchings, uh, etchings that represent all of the previous issues of this series, hands down. Ugh. Which These I, etchings I include love it. an ambulance, an ice cream cone, a guitar, more spiders. There's a, a grave. There's yeah, more spiders. Music notes. It's everything. It's as far as I'm concerned, it's everything that's like even specifically. There's an ice cream cone, and then there's specifically an ice cream cone with three scoops on it. Like they're calling yep. out all their shit here. I I, I absolutely love it. Yeah, and 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 the, he of course obviously finds out that uh, Ice Cream Man is here, and he congratulates Noah on quote making it to the end of the road. 
this is where I thought this is the end of the series. I thought there's going to be no more Ice Cream Man because, and I know that would be sucky because it doesn't resolve anything. But man, this this talk about the end of the road is like really fucking ominous. Yeah, no, I mean we we find out that the reason that this signal was um was going off was because other other um explorers have made their way. I mean, I think he's basically trapped one with the signal from the other with his signal to the other with his signal basically. Right. right. And all of these explorers keep showing up uh and he keeps killing them. Uh, and he says something like, oh yeah, that must be the light on their, on their gear that I couldn't figure out how to turn off or something. So yeah. they just keep coming. So Noah, appropriately enough, decides that he's going to put a fucking big ass hole in Ice Cream Man. And, um, it basically looks like it has the, you know, the it's the size of a fucking bowling ball. And you're like, okay, like this will be the real test. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like, he got shot in the shoulder before, yeah, he got up kind of quick when he was the general, but, you know, maybe all of this I'm an idea is just a fucking talk. Uh, And then Noah puts a bowling ball-sized hole in his chest, and it's like, okay, maybe this shit's real. Yeah, it's not even that he hits him, it doesn't even put a hole in the chest, because he just, it just sits there on the guy's chest, like there's a smoking thing, but we don't actually see a hole of any kind, which I... Is kind of terrifying. Like, I wonder if Ice Cream Man just accumulates more and more power over time. Because when he gets shot in 1919, there's actual blood. We do see, like, blood He, he gets out knocked of down. Yeah, and he gets knocked down, but there's blood as well. Um, well, he seems to be part spider in I mean, 12. <laughs> that's, okay, that's true. That's true. He's got this weird... Yeah. It's like a chair, but it's also part of him. No, because he stands up out of it. He stands up out of it. Oh, um, but okay. Yeah, it's, hmm. it's a it's a very strange thing. What's interesting is that uh, he, Ice Cream Man says to him, "You know, I'll be taking your ship." Noah says, "Why?" These men all had ships. He's like, "I don't need ships. I need a map." Which, what does that even mean? I don't even know what the fuck that means Yikes. because he yeah. wants Bob. He wants the little map unit that is inside the ship. Yeah. Um, and well, needless to say, uh. The ice cream man gets the better of Noah, and he magically shows up on Noah's ship, and he's dressed up as the ice cream man. He's no longer this horrible... The original iteration, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. he's no longer this horrible kind of beast of a man um, mm-hmm. that looks closer to his form in, uh, what is it, issue number nine, where he's kind of got these pointy ears and stuff like that. In fact, he does have pointy ears, but he looks like old and tired, um, and instead he's back in this humanoid form like that looks like a human as the ice cream man here. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I gotta hand it off to, uh, you know, tip of the hat to good old Neon on the letters. Like, I absolutely love in this issue how Bob has a very, like, it looks like a 1980s word processor font. Yeah, yeah. Um, for Bob, but, and, and Ice Cream Man, and I think this extends throughout this entire volume, you can tell when something has been, like, corrupted by him because it starts speaking in this jagged, bold font. Mm-hmm. And there's a moment where Bob gets corrupted by Ice Cream Man, and you can clearly see this in the transition of the lettering being done for him, where it switches from Bob's traditional pixelated uh, to this jagged, bold Ice Cream Man font. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it, it's such a fantastic, just showing, not telling moment. Like, it's like, if you want to talk about the power of comics to express things in ways you just can't have anywhere else. Like, that's one of those moments for me where I'm like, okay, this is something I can't see anywhere else. Yeah, yeah. And so the issue rounds off with Ice Cream Man flying away in Noah's Ark, and we cut to the planet again, and Kate in the the uh, mysterious phantom, you know, space traveler ends up being Cable. And the line that he says... Caleb, is the issue- yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry, excuse me, it's Caleb. And the line that he says is, on to the next one, Rick. Like, there's this constant, I'll be seeing you with these two. Like, Ice Cream Man is taking off, and of course, they're on the same planetoid. Why do Caleb and Rick have to be so close to each other? What is the significance of both of them being on the planet? Why didn't Caleb try to stop or help anybody? You know, there's this thing where it's it's kind of a question of, does Caleb only have so much time to influence before the ice cream man actually wins in these moments? Like, is Caleb constantly on like behind ice cream man and trying to, I guess, stop him? Or it, was it something that like, was Noah just completely damned um, 
because he had landed on the planet and there was nothing that Caleb could do. Like I, Nick, you, I know you wanted to bring it up before, but like the thing with about yin and yang with these two is is like it seems that they're constantly at odds, but one is always defeating the other. But again, we haven't gotten that that perception or that that point of view yet to see Caleb actually succeed against Ice Cream Man. Um, he's constantly on the like he's constantly behind he's constantly like losing and i mean i say losing in the sense that the ice cream man is always getting his way and he's always killing people and he's always you know doing the disturbing thing and we don't see caleb have any kind of influence on any of that he just is kind of there um but but again to go back to what i was saying before you know the ice cream man fears him we don't know for what reason but he kind i think he kind of fears him and they're always close to each other and i'm wondering if it's like are they one in the same person are they an entity that has to always be within a certain distance of each other or something else um i don't know i'm just theorizing at this point i mean yeah i i think the idea that between the two of them there's supposed to be a balance i think is definitely a concept that's explored um Gosh, I'm trying to remember. I I don't think. Do we see how Caleb gets hurt in issue? What is that? Eight. He had a he had a knife in his neck. Okay, but we don't see how it happened. No, I don't. Right? I don't believe so. Okay. Well, I yeah, I don't believe so. I, I could swear there was some some point at the end of issue seven with the invisible friend where. Um, Rick makes a threat to Caleb that, like, next time I see you, I'm going to use the knife or something. I don't know. Maybe that, maybe I'm just imagining that. But, yeah, I mean, I, I think what you have is sort of a game being played between these two. Right, right. Um, that is, uh, and uh, from that, uh, we, we have the balance, and the two of them play this game in some ways by proxy with people. Right. And I think this is probably pretty clear for most readers. Uh, but, but of course, the idea is that neither neither seeks, seemingly, I don't know, this could be up for debate, neither seeks to remove the other wholly from the equation. Yeah, yeah, there's never like, I'm going to kill you. There's always a, I'm going to stop you. Right, or like, I'll I'm going to I'm gonna hurt this person you love, I'm going to kill your, your, your wolf and wear it. You know, I'm going to yeah. kill your your vulture and end your fun, but I'm not going to take you out, so right. to speak. Right. But on the flip side of that, you could also argue that on some level, um, it seems that Rick has consistently upset the balance. Yeah. And as I said earlier in the show, I think there's some correlation between Rick upsetting the balance and planets being destroyed or or um universes having to be abandoned or something like that right because obviously i think i, I i'd have to reread 9 again but there's some connection somewhat being drawn between rick mutating all of the shit in 9 and uh the uncle being like you know what like we got to leave so yeah, well, he doesn't. He doesn't say it's because of that. I right? Think he no, just says uh, that he, the universe exactly. is dying. It's not spelled out. Yeah, and I and I think maybe this all like I think Rick getting out of control kind of begins with him killing the old man, like their uncle. I, I think right. like he wasn't supposed to die that way, or maybe he was. Like that dude seems like an all seen eye. Like if if Rick is supposed to be chaos and Caleb is supposed to be control, then I think the old man is a mix of the representation of both of them, where he represents like neutrality. Um, he's mm-hmm. not. He, he's a what? What do you call the uh, the oracle from fucking the Matrix? The you know. Ba- <laughs> I mean, I, I guess if you want to symbolically place him as being the balance, and then Rick killing him. I think basically if you want to look at it that way, and I think that's a smart way to interpret it, I mm-hmm. think you're onto something. Yeah, Rick effectively destroys the balance and says, you know what, fuck that. The thing that I think is interesting is that, you know, this volume ends with seemingly the end of the universe, right? If if Rick is, if everything is destroyed, humanity is dead, it's the quote unquote end of the road. Like, where does this series go? And I'm very curious to know 
what this story is going to bring next. I mean, I know that a lot of people have read it. I think issue 13 is out. Like, the, people have already started to read uh, it. But I don't man. think it's out yet, but it comes out this month. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. So, yeah. So, I mean, we're all in the dark right now. And I'm very curious to know what happens next. Uh, because where do we go from here? Right? If if chaos and destruction and the end of the world has already happened, what's next for the Ice Cream Man series? Right. And I think at that point, the question becomes regarding issue 12 um is this a flash forward that we're going to return from in the same way that 10 was a flashback that we returned from right right are we going to return back from 12 to modern day or is this a permanent flash forward personally i think we're going to return from it and maybe what we're seeing is um the potential of what could happen right in some ways right i will say this though if this is quote unquote really happening it does add one very valuable moment which is the fact that and i mean part of me was like okay maybe this is a different universe in a different time right except it explicitly spells out this is happening due to the destruction of earth yeah right yeah so we find out that caleb is still alive that's the big yeah. kernel for me that you draw from this is that yeah 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 whatever you think happened at the end of eight he's alive well yeah and it's uh, like we see we see ice cream man get shot i think in the earlier issues when the ice cream man was like a werewolf we see him get stabbed like these guys can't be killed i think i think that like and Ice Cream Man says it, you know, like that they're an idea. They can't be killed. Which, what the idea is, I don't know yet. But, um... Well, he says he's an idea. Well, he's yes. an idea, sure. I, but I, I think assume... you could probably argue both probably are. Right. But he's the one that keeps bringing it up. Well, and this is the thing that... Well, Caleb, again, I, I, there's this yin and yang thing, right? Where, like, there mm-hmm. is chaos and there is control. And... Or chaos and organization, whatever you want to, you know, however you want to balance those out. But, like, Caleb isn't going to call that stuff up. Caleb isn't going to reveal who they are and what they can do. Um, he's just going to show up. Like, this is why he uses guns. Like, when in the skyscraper issue, he's shooting stuff. He's not using his magic at all to stop anything. When I think that he has the same capabilities as the Ice Cream Man, and maybe in a future issue we will see him actually do that like there may come down to a battle of wills or something like that even if we do flashback and we know that the future that we just read in issue 12 is the final ending to all things where the story continues forever um it'll be interesting to see how they do that what what comes next and this is all the more reason to continue reading the series because of all of the questions that are still left unanswered despite getting so much information in this volume I think this is a this is like me making a, a crazy prediction, but wouldn't it be insane if Ice Cream Man follows the map, finds the new world, and he actually uses the arc to basically re to set up another Earth for him to fuck with? <laughs> that would be interesting. That would be very interesting. Which would be funny, especially after he he's the one who tells Noah he's like didn't like let's talk about this idea that you're gonna put into play. He's like. Don't you think this is kind of dumb and not going to work? Mm-hmm. And then Noah's like, oh, shit, he might be right. Um, you know, what if what if Ice Cream Man's just fucking with him? And he's basically going to go take this, go find that planet. That's why he wants the map. Set up, inert, set up Earth again and just start fucking with that one. Mm-hmm. Or even more crazy, what if we're about to find out that the Earth set up... What if he does that and the Earth that we've been reading about all the way up to this point is actually the earth he sets up following oh, 12. That, that would be very interesting. <laughs> Mind exploded. I guess we'll have to wait for the next volume before we can talk about this again. Um, but yeah, Nick, this is, uh, we got to wrap up because we've, we've talked about this series for way too long now. So, <laughs> um, yeah. I'm, I'm calling it ends. This was, this was a fucking wild ride. I really, really enjoyed reading this. Uh, I cannot wait for the next volume. I hope, I assume you feel the same. Yeah, honestly, for me, I think I liked Volume 3 better than Volume 2. Yeah, same. I mean, Volume 2 has a wonderfully strong issue in 6, but this was such an interesting balance of present, past, future, like, all wrapped in one. Mm-hmm. I, I think the only people that are maybe going to be disappointed with this volume are the people who kept seeing Caleb 
and um, Caleb and Rick really butting heads consistently throughout Volume 2 and just sort of having that specific interaction kind of pumped. Like, the brakes are kind of pumped on that a bit in yeah, this volume. Yeah, So I, I mean, I think I see this volume as more of a as a reflection of what their relationship is for the mo- like on the whole and those yeah, issues past, present, be- future. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll find out more in the next volume. I don't want to get into it too much. Cause we, like I said, we're running long here. So remember you can follow us on Twitter. You can follow Nick at death star plans. You can follow me at Mike rapid and you can follow the show at IRCB podcast where we post all sorts of stuff. I try to use Instagram as well. So make sure you're following us on Instagram at IRCB podcast as well. We would also love it if you went ahead and checked out our website. That's ircbpodcast.com, where we have a pronunciation guide for creators, and we also have a merch store. In addition, if you need to email us, you can contact the show at ircb at destroythesibe.org. If you have comments, if you have questions, if you have jokes, if you have corrections, that's the place to do it. It's important to point out that this episode first aired on Patreon, Thank you for supporting us if you are a Patreon supporter. And if you aren't, um, well, this episode and others like it are one of the many reasons to join on top of getting access to our uh, episodes a whole day earlier and all sorts of other things. Infinity Shred is the best band in the universe. They do all of our music. We can't thank them enough for letting us use it on the show. They have a new album coming out, so make sure you check their website to see when that's when that's dropping on infinityshred.com. Xander is a wizard. He edits the show. He's a cool guy, and he's a fun person to drink a beer and talk about just pretty much anything. He also edits the show, as I said. I want to say thank you to Nick for putting together this episode with me. I want to say thank you to the listeners out there. You guys are amazing. And until next time, comics are good, and so are you.